Paleo nerds. Two grown men. One plays with dolls. The other draws dinosaurs with crayons. Together they explore the prehistoric past with experts from across the globe. Paleo nerds. Cause deep time will blow your mind. So, uh, hey, Ray, how you doing? Good, good, Dave. Hanging out here, sipping a little bit of coffee. Feeling fine. All right. I'm still in Ojai, California, and you are in? Sitting here in Ketchikan, Alaska. It's kind of overcast today. I love Ketchikan. Ketchikan by the sea. I'm looking out at the Pacific Ocean out there in gray clouds, man. You are a lucky man living there year-round. I get to go there for a, a little time in the summer. Yes, and we always look forward to the arrival of the Strassman. Because <laughs> life changes here. Yeah, we all know when you're in town. Dave's here. Oh, no. Why? Why? Because I'm like, let's go fossiling. Let's go find that ancient cooked. You know what's crazy? When I first moved to Ketchikan, I was really disappointed because I saw so many of the fossils were cooked in geologic time, in geologic strata. It's not just beautiful sedimentary like out in Montana. The stuff was laid down millions of years ago, and then intense pressure and intense heat cooks the fossils. It's very uh, metamorphosized. It's very much cooked. But uh, yeah, you know, I mean, the thing is, when you're in the Dakotas or in the Midwest, that kind of thing, in the desert... You can see the outcrops. Oh, let's go over there. But here, there's a lot of trees and stuff. And as you know, you're down in California. The place to find the fossils are, you know, usually down on the beach. And those are the places where the sediment is exposed. You got to look for that kind of right rock. And yeah. And you and I have been to a few of those spots. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the nodule spots? We were uh, on this beach finding little nodules. Little nodules, that was a Triassic outcrop. Yes, that's yeah. actually the same stuff the ichthyosaurs were later found in. Oh, so cool. Very same cool. Same stuff, but on different islands. And that's the thing here is this island's got that, that island's got that. But And there's a thousand plus islands here in the Alexander Archipelago. Is that how you pronounce it? Archipelago? Yes, sir. I used to think it was Archipelago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dave, which is half the fun of this podcast is always constantly correcting you. Thank you. And every now and then, I screw up. I bow to your uh, literary genius, Mr. Troll. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Hey, um, I read an article about a anchovy with saber-toothed fangs. Is that the same fish you painted in the giant painting in my in my room here, saber tooth everything, or is this new? I have not heard about this. It's a giant, what, anchovy? Sometimes there's a fish um, that's named Encodus. It's a Cretaceous fish, and that might be anchovy-like, and it's got big, big fangs. Okay. So. I can't pronounce the name. It's uh, some huge Latin thing, and it's called Clupiopsis stralini. Clupiopsis? Yeah. Dave, in my pseudoscientific uh, career, I know that Clupia, is that the name? Clupiopsis strelini. So if it's uh, Clupiosis, it's in the herring family. Okay, it's a herring, yeah. You may not know this, but I have a uh, an extinct uh, genus of uh, Clupia form named after me, man. Here Funny. we go, here we here go. Here we go, I'm bragging again. <laughs> but it's called Trollichthys. You can't take that away from me, man. It's a whole genus a of round-bellied herring. I had no idea you had a uh, also a herring name after you. I know about the ratfish, but I didn't know about the... Yeah, it's an extinct herring from the Eocene, uh, from the Monte Bolca Formation in Italy. It's a spicy meatball! Dr. Giovanni Carnavale, named, if I love saying that, named Trollichthys a genus after me. That's so cool. We can maybe track him down in one of our episodes. I have a ventriloquist puppet named after me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Chuck Woodyosis. A lie. Oh, yeah. You get to name all your puppets, and they shall live on and on in eternity, man. There will, there will never be another Chuck. No, there will not. I want to be a real boy. So, dude, I'm really excited about our next guest. You've known him for many, many years, and I first met him. He was in Denver at the Museum of Natural History, 
And for the last five or six years, he is director of one of the finest museums on the planet. Actually, eight years now. It's the Denver Museum of Nature and Science that he was at before, but he is currently at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. I think we're talking about my buddy, our mutual buddy, Kirk Johnson, are we not? Dr. Kirk Johnson? Yes, Dr. Kirk R. Johnson. I've known the guy for... Oh, a couple of decades. We've done a couple of books. We've traveled a lot. Uh, actually, he and I once calculated, because he's a guy that likes to do numbers, we calculated that we've actually spent about a solid year together in our lives. So Get a room. <laughs> yeah, well, we actually have gotten hotel rooms, but we did learn early on to get separate hotel rooms because <laughs> I snore like a wounded Albertosaurus. <laughs> I know, Ray. I know. I've been camping with you. <laughs> Let's uh, give him a call. I'm looking forward to this. Oh, yeah, Kirk. He's a cool guy. You like him. Well, you know him. Dr. Johnson is on the line. Ready to roll, then. Kirk, so good of you to join us, man. Hey, Kirk. Long time no see. <laughs> Where are the little electronic dinosaurs, man? I got cheated. What the hell? Well, look. Can you see my screen, the painting behind me? Ah. Uh, yeah, that's my bedroom. Uh, and sadly, yeah. I'm stuck with your little face sticking out from behind a plant. I'm always watching you, man. I am always <laughs> watching. That is terrible. <laughs> Quick aside, I own a very large painting by Ray called Sabretooth Everything. It's hanging in my bedroom, and in the corner, he painted a little caricature of Kirk Johnson. So, awkward. Hey, Dave, our guest for today is Kirk Johnson, director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Doctor. Dr. Kirk Johnson. The Leaf Doctor. The Leaf, Leaf Doctor. doctor. Leaf Doctor is his handle on Instagram, but he is the director of the world's largest natural history museum. I've known this guy for 27 years. A blink in geologic time. <laughs> how did we all meet? I'm trying to remember that. I know exactly how I met this guy. He wandered into one of my exhibits uh, one time and said, hey, man, <laughs> you're not just the T-shirt guy. Quick aside, Ray Troll is known for his scientifically accurate and humorous artwork which you'll find on hundreds of thousands of t-shirts being worn across the globe. He also has designed and created critically acclaimed museum exhibitions which are touring the world this very moment. You're into fossils too, right? And that how it went down, Kurt? Yeah, it was a pilgrimage. I knew where you were. I had, I had a beat on you and catch a can at the Soho Coho and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna just quote unquote drop by, catch myself a troll. Yeah, you came in to catch a cam one day, but uh, we met at the Burke Museum, did we not? Yeah, no, that was like fall of 93. And I think one of the first things you did when you said, you know, man, if you're into fish, which I was into fish, you've got to come to the Amazon with me, right? That was the thing. I, I actually came with uh, malice of forethought. I was like, yeah, but I, I, I was at that point in my life where I was like, you just got to do what you want to do. And I, I was so into trolls, so I had a plan. Oh, really? My plan was I was going salmon fishing on Ball Island outside of Ketchikan. And then I had a day on the way back. And I said, I'm going to go see the troll. And I'm taking a stack of photographs of amazing fish from the Amazon. I'm going to troll these uh, fish photographs from the Amazon in front of Ray and offer him a spot on the next Amazon trip. That was my bait to catch the troll. Wow. And what year was that? I'm thinking it was 96. Does that sound right, Ray? Yeah, I think it was a few years after I'd met you and you yeah. were coming through. And I do remember you just call, kind of wandering in one day. And was it your first Amazon trip that you invited Ray on? No, I went in 94 and 95. So it would have been my third trip that he got invited on. And then I met you on the Amazon trip that Ray invited me on. Right. I have the official Bible of the Amazon trip. There were 12 trips to the Amazon. I've got the list of all the 220 people who went on the 12 trips. I know that you vetted everyone who was going to be on that boat. And I had to explain who this guy was. And I told him he was pretty cool. And he was a ventriloquist, and... I'm not moving my lips right now. Well, the rest is history, and that's it. Dave came along in 09. <laughs> so, why? Why the Amazon? Why did you, a leaf paleobotanist, decide to hit the Amazon? I guess that's an obvious question. There's a lot of leaves there. <laughs> we want to rob a bank, you know, and go to where the money is kind of thing, right? It, it was exactly that. I, I'd uh, been poking around in tropical forests and the Amazon is the mother of all tropical forests. And I got a friend who told me about this amazing guy, Moacir Fortes in Manaus. 
Quick aside, Moesir Fortes was our Amazonian liverboard riverboat captain, and he was a naturalist and our guide who commanded our expedition with unlimited knowledge. He also woke the entire hungover boat up at 7 a.m. every morning with this song played way too loud. <laughs> She said, you just, just, she said, just call this guy up. He will amaze you and you'll end up going on a trip with him. So I called him up and after the phone call, I took a bunch of buddies in 1994 and we went down. I think we had like 14 people. We flew to Manaus, got on the boat, mind blowing trip. You guys have both been there, you know the whole scene. And uh, after that first trip, I'm like, I'm coming next year and the year after that. I was blown away by how every single leaf had an insect on it. Oh yeah. No, in, in um, Every single leaf usually has lots of insects on them. And, and that's one of the cool things about leaves is they are so many things. They're how plants grow, but they're also how, um, you know, the most common kind of fossil of a plant is a leaf because any given tree might have a million leaves on them. And each leaf uh, serves as a place where insects land and can actually burrow into the leaf or bite parts of the leaves off. So when you find a fossil leaf, you actually are finding fossil ecology of plants and insects back and forth, this plant-insect interaction. And what drew you to leaves over dinosaur bones? Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I loved fossils, and I got lucky enough to find a really amazing fossil site in eastern Washington called Republic. I was traveling around with another friend of mine who happened to be an artist, a pre-Ray Troll artist named Wes Weir. <laughs> And uh, we'd heard that there were fossil flowers to be had in this little town. And we went there, looked around for a while, couldn't find anything at all. We were getting ready to drive out of town, and I kicked over a little piece of rock next to the side of the road, and it popped open. There was a perfect little metasequoia leaf on it. We're like, wow, this is the spot. So we dug a hole right in the side of the road and found fossil flowers there. And that was kind of it. That, that place is now a little museum. The town's got a little museum. And uh, that was day one for Fossil Leaves. So as a child, you were into rocks and all that. And you had a few fossil moments as a kid, did you not, before that? Yeah, my mom was from Wyoming, from a ranch in Wyoming. My dad was from California. So when I was a little tiny kid, we would drive either from Seattle down the coast to California or across the Rocky Mountains to Casper, Wyoming. So lots of driving and talking. And I got obsessed with arrowheads and rattlesnakes and rocks and stuff. And I think my very first fossil, which I still have, I found on the top of Casper Mountain at a family picnic. Little tiny chip of a rock, little tiny brachiopod fossil. But I, I convinced myself it was a fossil rattlesnake tail. <laughs> I was convinced of rattlesnakes, and, and then I thought, I got to ride a fossil rattlesnake. But um, I think, and then once you find a single fossil, you realize they can be found, and you start looking. And as a kid, that became my childhood superpower was finding cool things. And it wasn't just fossils. I had a metal detector. I was looking for coins. I was looking for shells, cool rocks, any little thing. It was more like a treasure hunt, the natural treasure hunt. Wasn't there a moment with a fellow and a hammer and a round rock that changed your life too? Yeah, that, that came when I was probably 12, I'm going to say, because I um I had started going to rock clubs. There are these things called rock clubs where basically retired Boeing engineers get together once a month and polish agates and make cabochons and trade fossil and rock stories, mainly rock stories, though, rock and gem kind of stories. But I would go because I figured some of these guys knew something about fossils. And at one of these shows, I saw this little round rock that had a fossil crab in it. And it kind of blew my mind because it had all of the legs and the claws and everything. And these turned out to be pretty um, relatively common fossils in Washington State, these little nodules that have crabs in them. And you walk down a beach and find a round rock and crack it up with a hammer and out pops this whole crab. And I got obsessed with those things, but I couldn't figure out where to go. So I kept asking people, and finally somebody turned me on to this highway um, repair guy who lived in Clallam Bay, Washington. And they said, this guy knows. He knows where to find the crabs. So I talked my dad into driving me out to this town. That's where they have the um, the county prison is in this town. And uh, 
this guy lived at the edge of town and went to his house, a really lovely old guy. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'll show you how to do this. So he took me to a beach with a sledgehammer. And he said, just look for the perfectly round rocks. And there's all sorts of round dead rocks. But he said, when you find the perfectly round one, just smack it away. And we found one that was about the size of like a volleyball. It's a pretty big rock we smacked it and inside was this amazing crab and that was pretty much it done signed sealed and delivered so how does the concretion form and why is it a perfect sphere i mean why wouldn't it be because crabs are oblong why wouldn't it be an oblong shape yeah you know it, it, it turns out now having cracked about a zillion concretions in my life um off when they're small sometimes they, the concretions are the shape of the fossil that's inside them and sometimes they end up being perfect spheres and it's and sometimes there's perfect sphere concretions that got nothing in them at all so it's there's some kind of process that after the animal is buried in mud some sort of chemical process starts making the mud around the animal very hard and it, you know, you get these beautiful concretions, and and they're they're common all around the world in different ages of rock. Does it form in layers over time? Well, no. the The sediment gets deposited in layers, but the concretion grows within the layered sediment. So often, you'll be walking along, you'll see a hill where there's a um, the layered rocks, and there'll be these round balls sticking out of the side of the hill. That's really cool. What I'm realizing, too, is I look at both you guys here. We're talking. You talk about your childhood superpower was finding fossils and uh, showing off all these cool rocks to friends. Dave, on the other hand, played with uh, played with dolls, uh, was entertaining his friends. I was drawing pictures of dinosaurs, and I was obsessed with dinosaurs. Well, wait, wait, hold on. I was also drawing rockets, Saturn V rockets. <laughs> And I was drawing diesel locomotives. I was fascinated with trains. And I also went out camping. So I was in the deserts and in the mountains. I didn't know there were fossils there, but I did have... Uh, I wasn't just playing with dolls, Ray. Okay, I'm sorry to, to, to <laughs> insult you, Dave. But what I was getting at is that I was a dinosaur-obsessed kid who couldn't find fossils Kirk, you didn't really care about dinosaurs, did you? You came to the rocks and the fossils in a totally different way. I had a passing interest in dinosaurs. I'd go by the museum and I'd go stand next to the dinosaur and look at it. But I didn't. I was not one of those kids that was obsessed with dinosaurs. I didn't. Um, I can't, have not found any drawings of mine as a kid that have dinosaurs in them. I have found a few pictures where I'm looking at dinosaurs, but I I didn't think about dinosaurs until the day that I found one. And, and then, uh, you know, I was at that point, I was, I'm going to say I was 22 years old when I found my first dinosaur. And um, I was climbing up a hill and there were two triceratops horns sticking out of the side of the hill. Like, well, now that is cool. No way. You mean? Yeah. Just like sticking out of the hill. Yeah. No. And it was, um, it was a partial skull of a triceratops that ended up getting collected by the Cleveland Museum. And it's so like. You're in late Cretaceous sediment? Yeah. 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 I was looking for leaves. <laughs> what do you expect <laughs> okay describe this so i mean could you have like accidentally fallen on them obviously they would have crumbled but i mean were they sharp were they, i mean the two triceratop horns sticking out of the side of a mountain sounds absolutely unbelievable well it tr turns out that triceratops is pretty common as a dinosaur and uh so lots of places and there's a whole bunch of acreage in wyoming north dakota montana south dakota Saskatchewan, Alberta, where if you bother to walk out in the Badlands, one of the most common things you will find is part of a Triceratops horn because they're pretty heavy, big things. And when the animal, like the whole Triceratops dies, it gets crumbled into pieces. The horns are kind of big, solid rebar, so like dinosaur rebar, basically. And so the, if you grind up a Triceratops, probably the last thing you got left is the, the, the horn... And they've got two big horns and a brow horn, so one of the side horns, or the, at the back of their skull, they have this thing called the occipital condyle, which is the ball joint that attaches the back of their skull to the first vertebrae of their neck. And those Which holds are, the massive head. Exactly. And those things are like bocce balls. Those are like, you find those all the time, just these round balls. People are like, what's that? It's like, that's the occipital condyle of a triceratops. So... Triceratops horns and occipital condyles are, are pretty common finds. And so it wasn't that unusual that I found it. It's just that 
I had never thought about finding a dinosaur, and then there one was. It was really cool. I was like, wow, that is really cool. Has anybody ever calculated the amount of possible individuals that could have existed? I mean, how, how many millions of years were dinosaurs in the, in the last form in the late Cretaceous? A couple million years? The, the dinosaurs were around from 230 million years ago to 66. So you're like 150 million years, and you get the entire world. And I mean, and don't forget a single, like 1 million years is a lot of time. I mean, think how many bison have lived just, just in your lifespan, hundreds and millions of them. I mean, there's probably, when, when uh, people got to North America, you know, in the 1600s, there were probably 50 or 100 million bison on the Western Plains. Or there were probably several million elephants in, in Africa just at one point in time. So you're talking billions and billions of individuals and a small percentage of them actually fossilizing and we're yeah. finding them in the 20th century. That's right. That's right. Which is which is why you can go find more of them because they're, if you're in the right age rocks, dinosaur bones are pretty common. So if you wanted to go find a dinosaur, you could just go find, you know, you, you might not find a great one, but you could find chunks of a dinosaur almost immediately in lots of places. So, Kirk, I have a question in that uh, that formation where you found the Triceratops, that's the Hell Creek Formation. And that is at the very last days of the dinosaurs, the uh, KT extinction line, the Cretaceous mm -hmm. tertiary line. There's been a lot of calculating on how diverse and how many dinosaurs there were at the very end when the comet struck. Right. And you're actually working on some of those calculations right now. You mean like a biomass calculation? Well, I hand it over to the scientists. I mean, there's two ways you can count dinosaurs. Right? You can count the number of species that are around, and you can count the number of individuals. And there's there's no real good way to count individuals because you're looking at layered rocks, and you know the, you don't have any way to calibrate it because you find even if you change your level in the rock a few inches, you might have jumped ten thousand years or something like that. So you really you know it's hard to measure a single time and then it's really hard to figure out how you would count anyway those things but what you can do is you can um look at how many different species that you have found for instance and um and, and so the hell creek formation the number is variable because of a number of reasons there's um if you are a generous what we call a splitter you get probably 25 species of dinosaurs in that last million years of the Cretaceous period. If you are a lumper, you might get as few as 10 species because, you know, some people think the different kinds of horn dinosaurs are the same. Some people think they're different. Porosaurus, Triceratops. It's a little bit complicated. So but that argument about how diverse the world was when the comet struck, whether or not the dinosaurs were tapering out or whether or not it was a rich biota at the time and everything came to a screeching halt with that event and that one very bad day. That, these are questions that uh, scientists stake their careers on. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, dinosaurs are found at many different times in the Mesozoic. They're found in these layers of rock called formations. A formation can be anywhere from like 10 feet thick to 2,000 feet thick. But the, one of the sort of general rules of thumbs is that if you're in a formation, it, it's, it was deposited over a certain more or less continuous period of time. So you usually find the same kinds of dinosaurs in the same formation. And then if you go down into lower formations, you find different kinds of dinosaurs. So one of the things that people have done is they've compared the number of dinosaurs in, the, in one formation with the number of dinosaurs in another formation. And the Hell Creek is the last formation. It's the, the highest one that has dinosaurs. It's the final dinosaur-bearing formation. So how many vertebrate species were alive at the end of the Cretaceous? Well, lots, because not just dinosaurs, but there were mammals and fish and amphibians and reptiles and birds and sharks. I mean, almost all the major groups of things that are alive today were alive then. And you find all of those things. You find, so, um, you know, lots and lots of different kinds of those things. So it, it comes across as a pretty diverse landscape. I mean, it's kind of like Africa, where you have elephants and rhinos and giraffes are these big things and then you got some carnivores like lions and hyenas and, and jackals and dogs and then you have some herbivores like 
you know, antelopes and dick dicks, and you got some rats and mice, and you got some porcupines, and you've got some hippos and crocodiles and birds. It, the Lake Cretaceous ecosystem was kind of like walking around in Africa, except that the lions of the Lake Cretaceous were Tyrannosaurus Rex. So that's a little bit different. Ouch. Yeah. No, the game just got a little bit, a little bit uglier there. <laughs> So, Kirk, I've known you all these years. Did you ever, in your wildest dreams, as a younger man, as a kid, dream that you would be the director of the world's largest natural history museum? Is this a childhood dream come true? Did you, or how did you get this job? Totally yes and no at the same time. Because when I was a little kid, I remember going to the Burke Museum in, in Seattle. And I met my friend Wes there, but I also met this guy named Stan Mallory, who was this great big mountain of a man who had um, fought at Tarawa in World War II. He was a big, big, impressive guy. And I thought he was the museum's director. Turns out he wasn't. But I wanted to be like him. But then, you know, over years, I became a paleontologist and worked in museums. I liked museums. But I liked being a paleontologist. I was not thinking very much about being a museum director. And even... Until about a year before I got this job, I had no idea that I was even being considered for the job or that I would even be qualified for the job or I could even do the job. And when they started calling me up, I'm like, what? You want me to be the director of the National Museum? And uh, I actually said no. I said, I, I, don't, I don't think so. That's What? Yeah. But you were pretty much involved in the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Sure, sure. I was, a, but I was a paleontologist. I became a department head, and I, you know, I was still largely thought of myself as mainly a scientist who was doing a little bit of administration to keep the place running. And I wasn't the director of the Denver Museum. I was, uh, you know, I got a, I became a vice president there, so I was the number two or three person at the museum. But you know, that's Denver. That's not the Smithsonian. So I, the whole thing was very surprising, and uh, and I got the job, and I took the job, and here I am. Ray told me that you, for your first couple years there, spent your off hours roaming the collections and the halls of that vast museum. What did you find? Did you find, you must have found some awesome stuff. You know, that museum is incredible. It's the largest collection of anything anywhere in the world. We have 147 million objects at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum. Everything in this museum comes to life at night. And I have two things. I have, as the director, I'm the only person who has the authority to go into any collection I want because all the collections are ruled by curators and all the curators report to me. So I'm the only person who can walk into any collection with authority. And I also have this thing called the number one key, which is the key that opens all the doors in the entire museums. So I'm literally the only person that can actually do what we just described was walking from collection to collection and looking at stuff and it's one of the greatest honors and privileges i've ever had and it's fantastic and i still do it to this day i'll be in there by myself and i'll i'll wander the halls and the collection rooms and see what there is to see and often the individual cases might be locked up so it's not as wide open as you might suspect and sometimes they'll come back and tell the curator where are the keys to that cabinet i want to see what's going on in that cabinet and they're like oh here's the keys and then then the journey continues uh but there's amazing stuff there amazing stuff ray ask the question <laughs> well my question to the good doctor is that uh, you've been through all the collections or a, a number of the drawers not everything it's probably a lifetime's job doing that but kirk what is the coolest fossil at the Smithsonian. What's the coolest one, the most awesome, most amazing one? Oh, man, that is such a hard question. Um, it depends what you like. Is it a leaf? <laughs> is it an ammonite? Well, we've got we've got probably 700 or so fossils on display in the new Deep Time exhibit. And, I mean, there are a couple best of in that exhibit um, ones. I mean, we have, like, the complete Stegosaurus um, skeleton that was collected at the Marsh Felch Quarry in Canyon City, Colorado, back in 1886, I think. 
and it's a complete roadkill stegosaurus, just you know, laid out like it was run over by a truck, about 20 feet long. It's got from the tip of its nose to the spikes in its tail and all the little bones around its neck. It's a pretty cool um, thing for sure. Is it compressed from sedimentary? Yeah, no, for sure. It's definitely, um, it's definitely. I mean, that's what we call it a roadkill. Looks like it got run over by a truck. Uh, but, you know, it's buried, and then the Morrison Formation in which it was buried itself was then buried under about 10,000 feet of further rock. So the thing was compressed, and then the mount, the Rocky Mountains came back up, and then this guy, Marsh, um, O.C. Marsh from Yale, launched this expedition to find the thing. And, um, you know, amazing, amazing find. And then, interestingly enough, uh, the Denver Museum twice, once in 1937 and then once again in 1992 when I was there, found stegosaurus skeletons in that same little tiny valley. It's, you know, only probably less than 10 stegosaurus skeletons known in the world, and three of them came out of one little tiny valley in Canyon City, Colorado. And when we found the one in 1992, I wasn't there, but the team I was working with found this thing. They called me up and said, hey, we, we found a stegosaurus skull sticking out of the side of the hill. I said, well, just dig into the hill. And so they dug in, and they dug in. Going all the way into the hill was a 25-foot-long stegosaurus. And just the neck was sticking out of the hill. But that one was 100, almost 100% complete. Amazing. So for whatever reason, in that place at that time, 150 million years ago, Somebody was driving over stegosaurus and <laughs> roadkill. Is there any analysis as to possible cause of death? Uh, not any, nothing that's good or smart. I mean, I think it's really hard to know why things died. Kirk, wouldn't you say the Wonkel Rex is probably the coolest fossil at the Smithsonian? It's certainly the centerpiece of the hall. The Wonkel Rex is a Tyrannosaurus Rex that was found by Kathy Wonkel in 1988 in Montana. And she found just one bone sticking out of the rock, and it was a, um, and it was an amazing, amazing thing. It was um, just the radius, you know, lower wrist bone or our lower arm bone of the T. Rex. And remember, the T. Rex has these little puny forearms. So this this bone was about as big as a um, candy bar, basically. It's a long, little candy bar shaped bone, and. Uh, she picked it up and was like, oh, cool, I found a dinosaur bone. And she kept it on her, her kitchen counter for about a year. And then they were taking a family trip to Bozeman, Montana, and she she went in to see Jack Horner. He wasn't there, but the other guy who was running the shop was there. And the guy looked at it he's like, oh, my God. Because people had never found that bone on a T-Rex. They found the bones around it, so they knew what it would look like if they found it. And here she had found, like, the rarest bone of the largest carnivore of all time. Is that the first radius ever found from a T-Rex? I think it is. I think it is. Wow. And so um, so they went back out to the site and started digging. And it, and it was, that's, you know, it's one of those classic cartoons where, like, you, like, somebody finds a little bone and the rest of the animal's in the ground. That's what happened, right? <laughs> they had to dig for two summers to get an entire Tyrannosaurus Rex act, just one little tiny arm bone sticking out of the ground. Did you you negotiated the deal to bring the Wonko Rex to the Smithsonian, right? It's on permanent long term loan. But it was found on U.S. government land, correct? Yeah, so it's a subtlety. It was found on land that was managed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and so when it was collected, the Museum of the Rockies collected it, and then they are a federal repository, so they can hold federal specimens. And they'd actually found a, they found two T Rexes on Army Corps of Land. So Museum of Rockies had two complete T Rex skeletons from U.S. Army Corps of Land in Montana. And um, before I got to the museum, Jack Horner had made a deal with the Secretary of the Smithsonian to get the Smithsonian a T Rex. And they'd actually given him some money. He looked, hadn't found one. So the, when I got the job, I had a conversation with Jack Horner. We thought, well, the best thing to do would be to work with the Army Corps of Engineers and transfer one of those two T-Rexes from Bozeman, Montana to the Washington, D.C. So that's what we did. And it's on a 50-year loan um, from the Museum of the Rockies to the Smithsonian. And what, do they dump it on the side of the road after 50 years? <laughs> Who knows what will happen in 50 years, but I think two things will happen. One is... So whoever is in my position will go to Montana and say, will you extend the loan for another 50 years? And then all the kids from Montana will come to Washington and say, say we want our T-Rex back. So it'll be a, a conversation that'll happen in 50 years. 
Why not settle for a plastic uh, replica? Because, Ray, man, the real thing is the real thing. Come on, <laughs> I, man. I, I, I wasn't promoting the idea. I was just, you know, planting the idea that yeah, <laughs> it will not do. Come on. For a museum display, it's much easier to mount a fiberglass replica and right. to yeah. have the real one in the back room, obviously. Very much so. And, you know, we different museums have different philosophies. And traditionally, um, there was a sense of you find a real thing, put it on display because people want to see the real thing. But right. a lot of the early mounts, actually, they didn't have the whole skeleton. So they had to either sculpt the missing parts or often they would take parts from multiple separate animals and make a little chimera and glue them all together and that was both of those things are not great because you might guess wrong when you sculpt the parts and you when you're putting parts of a different animals together i mean we all have different body sizes so you might have the thigh bones from a huge dinosaur and the arm bones from a small one you end up making a weird animal that's not very good isn't it true many many skeletons are amalgams of other individuals? There's very few completely articulated dinosaur displays. Yeah, that's that's very true. I mean, there are um, there are a few there are a few formations that are really good uh, for whole skeletons, and the the best probably probably the best in the world for my money is um, the Dinosaur Park formation in Alberta, Canada, where they do often find pretty complete skeletons. I mean, I I was I actually found one myself accidentally there. I have this long list of dinos of great discoveries that I almost made. And uh, <laughs> I took a trip in 1994 to to Alberta to the the fossil site at Dinosaur National Monument or Dinosaur Provincial Park, sorry, is what it's called. And um, I was looking for fossil leaves, and I found this spot driving along in the car. I said, "Hey, there's going to be fossil leaves right there. I can see the way the rocks are laid. There'll be fossil leaves." And they'd never found fossil leaves in that park before because they were pretty excited. So they let me go dig. And I went up the hill and dug. And sure enough, there were fossil leaves. And I was like, oh, he's the leaf guy. He can see leaves through dark, solid rock. <laughs> I, next summer, I came back with a team and we did a big quarry, excavated about three or 400 fossil leaves. I was feeling pretty good. I, I left. And then the guys from the Royal Terrell Museum came into my leaf quarry to get some leaves. And they pulled off three or four chunks of rock. And at the bottom of the hole, below the zone of weathering, was a perfect skull of an ostrich dinosaur. So then the, the leaf guys from the trail were really unhappy because the, the dinosaur <laughs> guys kicked them out of the quarry and said, that's a dinosaur, get out of here. <laughs> and they, they chipped away, and the whole skeleton was there. It's one of the best dinosaurs ever found in North America. came out of the bottom of one of my leaf holes. And it, no one would ever have found it if I hadn't done the leaf collection. I never found it because it was below where I stopped digging. But if you go to the Royal Terrell Museum in Al Drumheller, Alberta right now, and you walk in the front door, greeting you is my dinosaur. It's just this huge plaque. Boom. Right. Struthiomimus, right? Well, Something like that. Ornithomimus. Ornitho. Oh. Yeah. It's like a uh, giant ostrich-like bipedal theropod or a raptor. It's a it's about an ostrich sized animal, um, with no teeth in its mouth. It's got a beak, but it's got um, long arms and claws. And then on close inspection of the arms, they note these little bumps on the bones. I don't know if you've ever looked at a turkey's um, leg bone, but they're little bumps in the bones that are uh, where the feathers attach. So this is would have been an animal that we at least know had feathered arms and long claws, but a beak and no teeth. I have a Cretaceous extinction event question. Perfect. <laughs> and uh, but who knows about that? Um, the question <laughs> is, there has been some recent discoveries of possible strata that shows the day the meteor or the comet hit the Yucatan, uh, with tectites in mud. And so, well, the question is, has there been any pathology on the dinosaur bones that potentially show the day the comet hit? So th this is an interesting thing because a comet hit, or a meteorite, asteroid, um, a big one, 10 kilometers in diameter, probably hit, uh, and the question is, when did it hit exactly? So we spent a lot of the 90s and 2000s trying to get a precise 
date for when the actual impact itself happened. Because if you were to go back and look at the literature 30 years ago, they say, well, you know, sometime between, you know, 64 to 66 million years ago, this, this asteroid hit. But they didn't have a precise date for the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. And we finally found a way to date that layer. And we now know that it happened 66.043 million years ago, plus or minus 28,000 years. So, wow, that is precise. I'll tell you how precise that is. If I were dating you, let's say you're, um, you're, uh, I'm flattered. Let's just say that you're more or less 60 years old. Um, the precision which I could date you would be uh, to within seven days of your birthday. Whoa. So it's, we pretty much know when it happened um, and we know where it happened. But the question is, do we have any of the actual victims preserved? Because we have lots and lots of animals that lived and died before it happened. So we know life in what life in the Lake Cretaceous looked like, but it's a very big question to say the fossil that you are holding in your hand was an organism that was killed on that day or by that asteroid. But that's a much harder, much more precise question. And so you basically have to find the little thin layer, which Ray and I found one example of it in North Dakota. It's about as thick as your finger. And if you are immediately below that little finger thick layer, you could make the argument, well, you probably were alive before that layer was deposited. But if you're even a little bit below it, you were clearly dead before that layer was deposited. Is that the KPG boundary? Yeah. Yeah, we used to call it the KT boundary, Cretaceous tertiary, and then we changed some names and it became the Cretaceous paleogene boundary. And I find KPG to be so much less elegant than KT, but that's just me. I'm old school, still KT to me. But So there is a fossil site that shows, the, the theory is that it, it is the actual day. What do you think about that site? So I've been to the site. When I went to the site, I did not know that the scientist who was studying it was going to say that it was the KT boundary. I thought it was something else because the site is interesting. It looks like an ancient stream channel. It's full of these gigantic fish, like three foot long fossil fish. They're laid in like logs and it looks like they're buried in volcanic ash. And the site is actually about 30 feet lower than the KT boundary is in that area. So when I went to the site, I'm like, it's not a KT boundary. I didn't even think it was a KT boundary. It was too low. It was it, it was basically probably what we'd say about 300,000 years before the KT boundary. Um, but it turns out that what had happened was that right, right before the KT boundary, a stream had cut a deeply incised valley. So this site is the KT boundary, and it's lower than the KT boundary because it's in the valley, an ancient valley floor. The stream eroded through that. Yeah, so the stream eroded through. And so the, the um, guys that found this thing, this site, have uh, done two things. They published one paper which showed that it was a uh, KT boundary. They had the actual beautiful glassy tectites and other evidence of the KT boundary event itself. And then they talked to an a uh, writer who wrote an amazingly um, hyperbolic article in the New Yorker magazine. So you had a scientific article and you had a popular article. And the popular article came out a few days before the scientific article. And the popular article said a whole bunch of amazing things that were not in the scientific article. And that's the, that happened, you know, last year. And that's the state of play right now that we don't know anymore um, except for rumors. I read the article and I was blown away by the article and what it implied. So I'm pretty thrilled, but it's really interesting knowing that, uh, well, the skeptical science world is like, okay, let's prove it. Let's look at it. But so. describe the site, though. Isn't it a site of mud that rushed in that killed fish and there's tectites, which are pretty much air bombs from a meteor impact? So here's the argument. The argument is that um, the asteroid strikes in Mexico – and it blows out molten glass from the crater, which goes around the world, and it rains down, and the glass cools into little beads of glass. So, How big? Uh, well, typically, if you're close to the asteroid impact, it can be quite large. It can be like a building-sized chunks of molten. But very quickly, they, they get smaller. So typically, 
the ones we find in North Dakota are about a millimeter in diameter, like grains of sand size. It's just like a spray of melted glass, basically. Um, but they get there fast. They're blown in the initial um, explosion of the impact. They get there much faster than, say, uh, a tsunami wave. But the when the impact happened in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, there was it made a huge earthquake, and the seismic wave traveled pretty fast. So the argument these guys are making is the seismic wave, you know, the impact blows up, the, the, the tectites are flying towards North Dakota. Meanwhile, the ground is shaking and the seismic wave is moving towards North Dakota. And the seismic wave gets to North Dakota before the tectites get there and it starts swashing this channel around like a bathtub. And then these glass beads come plummeting into the bathtub, the swashed up bathtub. And that's the argument they're making is that they're seeing what they call a, um, a seish wave, which is a seismically induced wave caused by a distant earthquake that's then being pelted by microtectites coming from the sky that were blown out of the crater. And then in the layer, they find these fish. They found some ammonites, which are kind of unusual. And then they found a single mosasaur tooth. And then, and those things are discussed a little bit in the paper, but in the New Yorker, they talk about finding other spectacular things like dinosaur feathers and pterosaur eggs and all sorts of things you can't even imagine. Now, the interesting thing is I've talked to a lot of credible scientists who have been to the site and looked at those things and say, oh yeah, those things exist. There are feathers. There are pterosaur eggs. But no one's published them yet. So this has been going on for a long time. And we heard this story for the first time in 2015, and now it's 2020. And if I had found something like that, I don't think I would have waited five years to tell the story, but that seems to be what's happening. It seems to be an interesting real site, but only a bit of it is scientifically published. So we have to wait and see if there is a there there or not. But it allows you to imagine the day of the event. But tell us, why are scientific papers so important to validate a discovery like this? Well, until you have a scientific paper, it's just a just-so story. Let me explain what I mean. A scientific paper, you have to show your data. And if your data includes fossils, those fossils have to be deposited in a museum where somebody can go look at them and where somebody can go back to the site and re-look at your data. Because science is reproducible. Like, if, if this is real, we should all be able to go back to that site and dig a hole and find more tectites and more pterosaur eggs and more dinosaur things, all those things. And those specimens should be in a museum. None of that has happened in this situation. Like the guy that's described the site um, has his own private museum, and he's has, he has a lease on the property, so no one go to the property. So, like I say, it seems to be real, but we're not playing science yet. We're playing storytelling at this point in time. And I hope we get to play science, because science will then um, add a lot of detail to what we actually know. But what they published in the scientific paper was the presence of these tectites in this layer, which makes you really think, yeah, this probably was the KT boundary layer. And it's pretty interesting because you have these big fish washed in there, there's ammonites washed in. And if any of the other things actually come to be published, it's going to be even more amazing. Are there any tectites in any other KT boundary layers around the world? Oh, yeah. No, that's one of the ways you distinguish a KT boundary layer is you find tectites. In fact, Ray and I found tectites at the KT boundary layer just 1.7 miles from the site we're talking about. And we found those in the year 2000. So 15 years before the guy found them, we were there. Wow. I didn't know that, Kirk. Remember that, Ray? I remember that, what, we were that close? We were 1.7 miles from the site. But yeah. actually, so we found the layer. We're, wasn't that the first time the layer was found in the Dakotas? Yeah, they, we had found, there's lots of ways you can tell the KT boundary besides finding the actual layer itself. You find the extinction of pollen, for instance, from plants that went extinct to the boundary, which is microscopic. But Ray and I was showing Ray this site where I said, this is where the KT boundary w layer would be if you could ever find one. And I chipped away the rock and we're lying in our bellies. And I'm like, oh my God, there it is. Was it hard rock? Was it hard sediment? Or was it uh, crumbly? It was crumbly clay, a layer about as big as my finger. And as, as we're lying there, I was so amazed we found the layer. But then I'm looking at it in my hand lens and my eyeballs resolve the round shape of the tectites. Wow. I, that, that was one of the most amazing moments I've ever had. And Ray was there to watch it, so like blow by blow. 
Well, I was going to say that day was a really, truly extraordinary day because we pulled up at the truck and you, you turned me loose and we started wandering through the, the Hell Creek Formation. But I was beginning to pick up random dinosaur bones, chunkosauruses here and there. I was stunned, like, wow, it's that easy to find them. And I was being enthralled by these chunks of bone, and you fell to your knees looking at this little little stripe of mud. And uh, only you had to beat it into my head how important this was. And we took, we did manage to do a selfie there, and it was it was very cool. Are there any, look, meteor impacts have happened throughout the planet's history. Yeah, Are there yeah. any other iridium layers uh, pre-Cretaceous? Yeah, no, there's, there's one at the Devonian. Quick aside, the Devonian period, also known as the Age of Fishes, lasted 61 million years, ending 358 million years ago. That's a very long, long time. Um, there's a Devonian impact site that's produced a little bit of an iridium layer. Worldwide? Well, no, here's the problem. Devonian is like 400 million years ago. And so the older you get, the harder it is to get precise on dating something. And, you know, for, for example, there, um, because the continents are always floating across the oceans and eating up ocean crust, um, you can't find old ocean seafloor. You have subduction and it just vanishes and turns into right. new rock. So the, the oldest C4 on the planet is about 170 million years old. So it means it's old enough to have places where you can find the KT boundary at the bottom of oceans. But the Devonian is more than twice that old. So all that seafloor is gone. So it becomes a much more challenging problem to answer the worldwide question. Even the KT boundary, the worldwide question is one you should actually ask for details. Like, say, like how worldwide? Where, where do you find this? And it turns out KT boundary is now known from... Over 300 locations around the world, 200 of them come from ocean basins because the ocean basins were there 66 million years ago. So you find in the deep sea drilling wells, 100 of the sites come from sites that were land at that time, but most of those land sites come from North America. So we don't we don't have a KT boundary from Africa right now. We don't have one from India right now. Found in New Zealand, they're in Antarctica. They're in North America, they're in Asia, they're in Europe. But again, they, they're they really hard to find because you're, look, you're basically asking this question, you take me to a spot that was once the surface of the earth 66.04 million years ago that was actually subsiding a little bit so it would catch a little layer that was an inch thick that would then bury that layer and then that, that layer would be buried and then come back to the surface and be back at the surface today waiting for you to find it. And it's like vanishingly rare that that would happen to you. Pretty astronomical. Wow. Yeah. Hey, can I change gears here just a little bit? Kirk, I've been with you and known you all these years. That day was a truly special day when we found that when you found the lair and I went, whoa. But I have been <laughs> with you when we found some pretty incredible fossil discoveries. You know, we come across them. I know that those days are seared in your brain. This is just like life altering. You, you, you kick that rock open in Republic and wow, there's an entire career that starts or what are, can you just walk us down memory lane? You have been to so many fossil sites. What are some of the most profound fossil moments for you over the course of your life? Just go. Yeah. No, I actually have this thing. I've been, I've been thinking about writing this book about the, the most amazing fossil finds I didn't make. Cause I've been, I've been, <laughs> with people and they found amazing things. I found a ton of amazing things myself, but you know, it's like, if I sort of string together the beads, like there'll be the thing where I was walking down the beach on Axel Heiberg Island in 1985. This is up in the Canadian Arctic Island and we're carrying rifles cause there's polar bears and I'm scared to death of polar bears. And there were little icebergs in the water. And I'm like, I, you know, that could be a polar bear. That some, I'm, I'm just going to, go up and walk a long ways away from the beach. I'll go way up the hill. I'll say like 300 yards up the hill. And my buddy's like, ah, you're an idiot. I'll just stay down and walk by. So you could see the polar bear running. Yeah. Well, you know, we had a gun, but I'm like, if he came running, he'd get us. So 
So we, so I'm walking along parallel to the fjord at about 300 yards from the edge of the fjord. And my friend is like 100 yards from the edge of the fjord, where I had been moments before. I get up, we're walking along. I no longer get up to that level and start walking. He goes, hey, come look at this. I was like, oh, no, what do you find? So I go down there. And right on the ground was an Ice Age fossil narwhal skull with a nine-foot-long ivory tusk just lying there. Just lying there. That's like, oh, man, I could have found that, but I didn't find it. Fossil envy can be a very ugly thing. So you mean a 15, 20,000 year old yeah. that had been buried in the in the cliff sediments and eroded out. I don't even know if anybody's ever found a fossil narwhal ever before or after that because narwhals are pretty rare things. And wow. and uh, so it's kind of like the dinosaur at Terrell Park where you're like, I found the hole, but I didn't find the dinosaur. The people still call it Kirk's dinosaur because they wouldn't have found it if I didn't dig the hole. So I, um, I would say that... Um, when we were digging at Snowmass, Colorado, for the Big Ice Age site, went early in October of 2010. Can I say, Ray and I were in your office when you got the call from Ian. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And your jaw dropped. Yeah, no. I mean, that, that site is one of them. It's, it is the best. <laughs> what, what we found was the, the best high elevation Ice Age site in the world. But... It was the best because it had over 6,000 bones in the end. After we dug for 50 days, we got 6,000 bones. But on probably day four of the digging, when we had found parts of several mastodons, um, we were we had these bulldozers are still moving lots of dirt. And a bulldozer went by and out popped this thing that looked like a tusk. It was about five feet long. Big thing. And... It wasn't five. It was like four feet long. It looked like a tusk. We ran over and picked it up, but it wasn't tusk. It was bone. We're like, what it's is that? We're, like, we're kind of puzzling on this thing. And then one guy said, he said, it, it could be the horn of a giant bison. Um, but it was like, I mean, it was big. It was like, you know, eight, nine inches in diameter. It was huge. So we we wrapped it up and we're like, wow, that's cool. And the bowlers, it takes another pass, out pops the other horn. <laughs> we're like, oh my God. <laughs> so then they were like, oh my God, we just ran a bulldozer over a skull twice. And that's called a Lafronensis? What's it called? Bison latifron. So we so we, we went and dug and there was the skull. We hadn't crushed the skull. And after a lot of um, special gluing, we put the whole thing to the other. The skull is like a, what was preserved was seven and a half feet wide. The whole if you gone horn tip to horn tip on the animal, it would have been like ten or eleven feet horn tip to eleven tip. Amazing fossil! Wow, yes. very cool. I've seen that specimen. Those horns go straight out laterally. Yeah, wait to see. I, I've just um, I bought a replica of it to put it in my kitchen counter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna kind of dominate the space. I'm afraid, but. <laughs> It just couldn't. I couldn't resist. Um, but you know, we there have been so many cool fossil sites, right? Just where you go, I think uh, another amazing discovery was up in the Canadian Arctic when we were there in 1984 on Devon Island. There's a asteroid impact crater that um, formed, and when asteroid impact craters form, they create holes in the ground, and holes fill up with water and become lakes. And lakes are fossil traps because, you know, sediments are being deposited in the lakes. So this was a known asteroid impact crater. They thought it had been formed around 20 million years ago. And um, the geologists had mapped it as a crater. So we went in there and we were looking for fossils in the crater lake bed sediments. And there were lots and lots of fossil rabbit skulls. Um, that was a pretty common thing. And then uh, was with a woman named Mary Dawson from the Carnegie Museum. And she went up to the top of the highest hill. She's like, hey, come up here. So I crawled up there. And the top of the hill was just this shattered bone everywhere. So we're crawling around. And, you know, the, the ground up there freezes. It's permafrost. So in the summer, it, it thaws. In the winter, it freezes. And there had been a skeleton that had been eroding out. And then it had been sort of this through this trash masher of the permafrost freeze thaw effect. So all the bone chunks were maybe the size of walnuts or something like that but there was thousands of them so we started picking them up and pulling them together then we started finding teeth 
And when you find a tooth, you can tell what kind of the animal is. And, and Mary Dawson was a mammal specialist. She's like, this is a rhinoceros tooth. A woolly rhino. We're like, we're, we're latitude 78 in the Canadian Arctic. Holding, it's not a woolly rhino, because woolly rhinos live in the Ice Age. This is a 20, we ended up dating this crater at 22 million years, more or less. It's a 22 million year old rhino that would be similar to the Sumatran rhino of today. Um, and so we, we dug all those pieces, brought them back to Pittsburgh, glued them together because they were fresh breaks. And it was pretty clear that there, we were looking at parts of whole skeletons. So the next summer we went back to the same spot. The permafrost had thawed down another level. We get a similar amount of bones, bring those all back, glue those all back together. And pretty soon we're looking at more or less a whole rhino. And then Mary went back for a third summer and got one last batch of bones. So we had this whole complete rhinoceros skeleton, which Mary Dawson has been working on her whole life. She's still at the Carnegie Museum. The discovery is wow. made in 1984. The rhino has not yet been published, but um, it exists. And meanwhile, the guy I was with went and we decided that um, it was on a river that had no name. There's lots of no-name rivers up there. So we applied to the Canadian Names Board to name Canada's first and only rhinoceros river. Score. But the rhinoceros itself is in the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, still being um, tweaked away. It's an amazing, beautiful, unambiguous fossil rhinoceros from the Arctic. <laughs> is the footage from that fossil site in polar extremes? No. So Polar Extremes, I went back to Ellesmere Island. Another aside, Polar Extremes is a two-hour PBS Nova special hosted by Kirk, who travels to both the Arctic and Antarctic in search of fossils that prove warmer climates existed at the Earth's poles. Which is, when I was, when I was up there in 84 and 85, I went to Ellesmere, Axel Heiberg, and Devon Islands with Mary Dawson and Leo Hickey and this guy named Cliff Morrow. And um, I, what we saw in Ellesmere Island were these big petrified tree trunks. And they're more than a thousand miles north of the nearest living trees, which really is kind of a profound realization as well. So that's why I went back to Polar Extremes is to go for those tree trunks. But I also wanted to go for the nostalgia of just being in that place where I was when I was 23 and 24 and made these amazing discoveries. Wasn't a petrified forest described by some of the early sailing ships looking for the Northwest Passage in the 1700s? In the 1800s, they, they gathered in the late 1800s. It wasn't 1700s, they didn't get up that far, but they definitely found coal seams and fossil leaves and tree trunks up that high. But remember, this is, um, this is long before people had a concept of plate tectonics. The idea that there were these weird polar forests was in the scientific literature in the 1880s. You can read about it. Um, people had these ideas, but somehow people forgot about it. And it didn't become relevant until plate tectonics came to place and people said, well, maybe the things were deposited at low latitudes get moved to the higher latitudes. And then when it was shown that no, those things were living there, then the study of climate change came along like, oh, uh, now we see what's going on. There used to be a warm world and now it's a cold world. I used polar extremes to turn a conservative neighbor into believing that climate change actually could possibly exist. Thank you, Kirk. That's why I made the film. <laughs> well done. Actually, in a previous uh, episode, actually a different show, the Making North America in 2014, speaking of spectacular fossil finds. Oh, yeah. And the climate change. I was there that day, that morning. Was it a morning? Yeah. The, the, the yeah. tide was coming in. Yeah, 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 yeah. When we found the palm tree. Describe that for our listening audience. Oh, yeah, no. So we were in this little bay in coastal Alaska where Ray, had, Ray and I had been there once before, and we'd found some fossil leaves. So we wanted to go back and find more fossil leaves on camera. And uh, the, we'd gone in the morning, and there was a place on a big tide range, and, and the rocks had the fossils in it were below the level of high tide. So we had to get there at low tide, and then we had to film fast before the high tide came up and, and flooded the site. And we were finding nothing. I mean, like Ray, at one point in the film, Ray goes like, <laughs> big nada. <laughs> it's like, we're finding nothing. And I was like, I had brought this British film crew all the way to coastal Alaska, and the tide was coming up, but we had nothing to show for it. Absolutely nothing. And then the, the director was a bit nervous, nervous type. And, uh, you know, he was, he was getting a little bit ugly. And, and uh, so I was running around saying, just guys, pull up big slabs of rock. And we got this one spot 
with this big crowbar and we pull up the slab of rock the size of a desktop and I just cannot believe it. Like we pop it open, there was an entire palm frond, like an entire palm frond that was there. And we got it on camera as the tie was coming up. None of us swore. Or None of us swore. Yeah, it was like, holy. <laughs> what? What? And then as the tide was coming up, we grabbed the adjacent blocks too, because we figured this is a piece. We figured we'd get the adjacent pieces. So we grabbed the adjacent pieces and brought them back. All told, it was like each piece weighed about 150, 200 pounds. And we got them back to the museum, and sure enough, we got the edges on both sides. So we got a seven-foot-wide palm frond from Alaska, live on camera. That was that was a highlight as well. That was... And that's 50-million-year-old Miocene? No, it's more Eocene or Paleocene, so 55 million years. So I've got the Miocene wrong. Correct me. Ray, correct me, please. I was going to pounce on you, man. It was during the Petum, the Paleo-Eocene Thermal Maximum. Oh, my friend. which yeah. is when the planet was the hottest it has ever been. Super hot, super hot. Well, that doesn't include 2021. Well, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, we're getting there. We are not heading for a cool summer, are we? I got to no. say, it's 70 degrees here in Alaska, southeast Alaska today in May. So the Paris Accord uh, is trying to keep the world from gaining two degrees centigrade of temperature. And now that's two degrees over the Industrial Revolution till now. We've already come up one degree centigrade. So we're trying to keep one additional degree more from happening. But the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum was a lot warmer than that. It happened in a world where already there were no polar ice caps. And then the temperature went up like five degrees centigrade. So a warm world warmed by five degrees is that through volcanism probably volcanism some because you what you need is some mechanism to create greenhouse gases so these are volcanism or it's the melting of methane ice in the seabed or it's a lava flowing through a coal field or an oil and gas field or something like that <laughs> but it was a, a whopper of a, a climate wait a minute I'm just picturing lava flowing through a massive coal seam would catch that all on fire wouldn't it yeah, let's, I mean, if you, humans, how do humans release carbon dioxide? They burn fossil fuels. You can burn fossil fuels in the Cretaceous. You just have a volcano erupt into a coal seam or an oil and gas field. So that's a, that's a natural way to burn fossil fuels. And aren't there burning coal seams concurrent today around the world? They happen naturally. They, they happen in two forms. A lot of coal mines actually catch fire because um, the coal will combust. It can spontaneously combust the right amount of light on it. And they smolder for decades. Yeah, but there's also pl there's several places where coal has naturally caught on fire. Like in North Dakota, for instance, where there's coal seams exposed in the buttes, a good grass fire caused by a lightning strike could light a coal seam on fire. And there are many places where they're burning coal seams and the, with the, the coal burns the adjacent rock and it makes this bright red uh, brick-like rock called clinker or scoria. And um, if you go around North Dakota, even today, you'll see red capped hills. That, that's the red brick formed by the burning of coal seams that was lit by lightning striking grass and causing grass fires, which caught the coal on fire. Wow. Pretty cool. Hey, Kirk. Ray. Do, do paleontologists need artists? Uh, the good ones need artists. The average paleontologist have not realized they need artists yet. It's, a, it's known as artist deficit syndrome. But uh, I always like to say that uh, every paleontologist needs an artist. And every artist needs a paleontologist. You are a scientist that collects artists, and uh, and I guess I'm an artist that collects scientists. But art is in your background too. As I I was reading your dossier, you you had a double major in college, did you not? I, I did because I was um, I liked to doodle when I was in high school and draw little things. And my my friend Wes Weir, who was the guy that got me into museums, was an artist. And he encouraged me to get a Mont Blanc pen and India ink and uh, buy acid-free paper to do my doodling with. Excellent. So I was doing uh, archival quality doodling as a high school student. But I was not doing uh, high-grade doodling. <laughs> my art was pretty, you know, it was uh, C-plus kind of art, I would say. And I, so I did, I did, in fact, double major in, the, in college, but... I was pretty clear that my skill set lay elsewhere. So 
I learned later in life that if you want to be good at something and you're not, you can either learn how to be good at it or you can just collaborate with somebody who is. And that's, in fact, I had that realization when I ran into a guy named Ray Troll who was like, that guy can draw. That guy can draw the way I want to draw. And it's easier to collaborate with Ray Troll than to do a Ray Troll like drawing. Well, vice versa, Kirk. You're the scientist that I never was and never really could be. I could only be an okay scientist, but uh, uh, you've worked with a lot of different artists over the years. Um, what I do, I don't take direction well, do I? Not at all. You get a little <laughs> bit better, but I mean, <laughs> I remember that like you're supposed to do a painting of the Cretaceous Seaway and you drew a picture of the Badlands <laughs> of Utah with the flaming hand holding a trilobite. That was like, wow. Your most egregious uh, deviation from task I've ever seen. That piece is in my living room. I own that. The the uh, angry bugs of Zion. That's it. I called it. <laughs> Just sounded cool. never asked you if you could time travel but back into the past if you could go back in deep deep time in the way way back machine what geologic age would you go to and what would you want to see oh that is a really hard question it would be a toss-up if i could go, only go to one place in the deep 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 time i would go back to the carboniferous to one of those coal-aged forests where the trees are green from the top of the tree down to the bottom of the roots and the trees look like giant scaly fish. This uh, scale tree forest of what Pennsylvania looked like 300 million years ago. And I wouldn't really care too much about the animals. They're those great big skateboard-sized millipedes and seagull-sized uh, dragonflies. But really what I want to see are those crazy trees. It's a kind of forest that you'd never see anywhere in the world today. If you gave me a second choice, I would go to the Jurassic or the Cretaceous and see the really big dinosaurs like Patagotitan because I just don't understand how those things work at all. I want to see how they eat, what they're eating, how they swallow, and how big their poop is. Kirk, you could help me here. There seemed to be a lack of belief in science recently. It seems as though there are forces at work that are trying to discredit facts. And a lot of times someone would say, oh, that doesn't exist. And I would say, when did you stop believing in science? So what do we do? What can you do? What can we do to say a fact is a fact? Uh, what you heard from that guy, he's not a scientist. He's just telling you what he thinks but it's not based on fact. How can we get people to believe in facts and science? Well, I think, you know, you're seeing a couple of things here. Even with this vaccine thing or, you know, the whole COVID virus thing, people are splitting uh, based not on their um, fear of the virus, but based on their <laughs> political beliefs. And I, I think that the real challenge is that we're, we are more tribal than we are logical. And you tend to you tend to hang with tribe, and if if your tribe has a certain set of values that deviates from science, you're going to be going with your tribe, not with science and logic. And that's that's the way it's always been. I mean, science has only recently started to make inroads into the human mind, and there was never a time when science ruled the roost. We have seen more and more amazing applications of science, and you'd think they would convince more and more people that science is a way to know the world. But I think the way to do it is to actually um, tackle the tribalism part of it, not the science part of it. Facts are dry and hard to interpret. That you, you can't internalize a fact when it's data sets and graphs and millions of years. The average person can't relate. Well, I do think that science has a science communication problem. And if we did a better job at communicating science, that would be part of the problem. But it wouldn't get us all the way. We'd still run into that barrier of tribalism. So we've got to figure out how to do that as well. And th I think the way to do it is to actually explicitly go out of your way to have conversations with people that disagree with you and do it in a respectful way. Like actually don't diss the person, discuss 
the issue that's at hand and, and, and try and build that. I think so much of, uh, you know, you say, oh, that person's stupid. They don't believe in science. Well, you just call somebody stupid. It does not make them inclined to be nice to you or like you or listen to you. So I think I think that's the key thing is is finding a way to have civil discourse in the world. And it's tougher with, with you know, stuff like Twitter because people are can sit in their basement in their underwear sending angry tweets. Well, the other virus is social media. Yeah, no, that's right. You know, it's that, that idea, Kirk, that uh, sitting down with people and having the dialogue, you once wrote your seven-word autobiography, and I will quote you here, Coastal Creationist Kid Finds Rocks and Evolution. You were raised as a uh, Seventh-day Adventist, one of the most uh, fundamental religious groups that literally brings us a literal interpretation of the, of the Bible. But yet, you and your father uh, still have visited the church and en engaged folks. And you, how, how did your creationist upbringing bring you to be one of the world's leading scientists now? I think it's a really interesting story. Well, I mean, I think the, the bottom line there is that um, there was lots of discussion about the topic of evolution in the church because the church dogma was that evolution did not happen. So there was, you know, lots and lots of discussion about it. Well, meanwhile, um, my my friends who are not in religion situations didn't hear a lot about evolution. So I'm hearing a lot about it. People are talking about it. There's lots of discussion about it. They're saying this didn't happen, but they're having that conversation. So I was aware of the arguments around evolution long before any of my colleagues, my friends of my age who didn't go to church were because no one teaches evolution in this country. So ironically, the church taught me about evolution and um, they taught me about science, too. And our particular church, we're in a conservative denomination, but the specific congregation was pretty liberal. And there were some pretty good scientists there. It was a scientist at the University of Washington who was a chemist, became a provost, who was very interested in me becoming a scientist. So I was also getting good science coaching. So you had a church congregation of intellectuals. You lucked out, dude. Yeah, no, totally. No, I don't think it would have happened to me necessarily in a different congregation. Well, I want to say that your contribution through the NOVA programs uh, is on par with Neil deGrasse Tyson. You are opening up science and the idea of climate change to the average person. And I think it's just absolutely honorable and awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks. Not to mention the books that he does with these people, you know. <laughs> oh, you mean those cruising the fossil freeway books? <laughs> and the coastline book, you know, I'm a yeah. shill. Come on, man. I, I gotta, hey, didn't I, I come up with the, the name? Here, man. Didn't I help come up with the name because you wanted to call it some religious thing? Actually, or? no, I actually got to say, I got to credit my ventriloquist friend here that we were going to call it cruising the eternal coastline. Oh, right. Right. And Dave was the one who said, you know, that kind of sounds like, you know, a squishy, new agey, you know, it sounds religion. weird. You know? so, yeah, yeah, religious. Too late. So, Too late. <laughs> I feel, you know, actually, now that we've brought up ventriloquism, I'm wondering, Kirk, can you see, is there a role for ventriloquism in the world of paleontology? Well, I think it'd be awesome on the outcrop to have each of the organisms, like, making their voices be heard. They, you know, there's uh, th who is this guy? Ari Rudenko is doing um, Hell Creek inspired modern dance. <laughs> oh, it's awesome! So I think there's there's always room for a ventriloquist. So we could bring Dave to one of the outcrops and have oh, some yeah. fun with his his his, uh, his little pe people. As you know, I'll I'll come and the puppet will stay in the suitcase. So uh, good luck with that. <laughs> Sad. So, Kirk, you've uh, we've all been taking a little break from the world right now, but I know you're eager to get back to it. When you get back to it, where are you going to be? What are you going to be doing? We opened the uh, David H. Koch Hall of Fossils called Deep Time in June of 2019 at this National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. And that exhibit is an amazing exhibit. And once the virus goes away and people come back to the museum, they'll be able to see that. But we're thinking about the what next for the museum. And there's a second floor to that museum where there's about thirty to 50,000 square feet of space. And I want to build the mother of all biodiversity halls. So I want to build a series of exhibits about 
humans and nature for the 21st century that'll just blow your mind. I have no idea what it's going to look like, but um, that's what I want to do next. Kirk, thanks so much for uh, being a part of this. Uh, it's awesome. Thanks, Dave and Ray. It was really fun chatting with you guys. Nothing more fun than talking about fossils. Well, we'll do it again because I want to hear that blow-by-blow -blow description of the meteor down in Mexico. Anytime, my friend. Anytime. <laughs> See you, Kirk. Later. Cheers. Hey, Dave, that was awesome. It was pretty cool talking to Kirk, wasn't it, man? Yeah, that was great. And you know what? I figure we're going to have some more calls with him because uh, he is a plethora of paleo information. The proper way to say that word is plethora. Damn you, Ray. I really felt like a kid in the candy store listening to him. There are so many stories from Dr. Johnson. I have learned so much from the man over the years, and it's so cool to have him on our show. All right, buddy. I will talk to you later, and thanks. Right. Uh, this is Dave in Hawaii, California. This is Ray Troll signing off from beautiful Ketchikan, Alaska. Thank you for listening to Paleo Nerds. Make sure to like and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you're listening. If you want to learn more about what you heard today, check out our website, paleonerds.com. You'll find tons of pictures and links, including photographic evidence that today's guests and your hosts have been Paleo Nerds for a long, long time. Again, that's paleonerds.com. Thanks for listening.